Once you have your general dashboard successfully configured and have metrics in all of the boxes, you've established network traffic into it, you have a variety of vCenter metrics on display, you can go on to enable the additional dashboards that come as part of your suite. This video is going to cover installing and configuring the VDI dashboard for desktop infrastructure. To get that going, we're going to need to leave the general dashboard and go ahead and log back in again to um, to the to the dashboard in a little bit different way. You can go ahead and leave the general dashboard open because we'll be coming back to it, but go ahead and open up the web browser that you used to launch Zangati and go ahead and click the login button one more time. Java will again restart, of course, and we'll go ahead and take the various warnings and say we want to continue. This time, instead of logging in as admin or VI admin, we're going to log in as VDI admin and the same thing as password, VDI admin. And it's going to give us an opportunity to change the password. So you can go ahead and change yours. I'll change mine. Put in a password hint. When the VDI dashboard opens for the first time, you'll notice, first of all, that there's some getting started tips that may be very helpful um, to you. And you can go ahead and read those. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it for the time being. You can always get the tips back by going under the options menu. One of the first things that you'll notice besides the tips is that all of the boxes are blank. Unlike the general dashboard, which immediately starts displaying all the information that's present in the dashboard, the VDI dashboard is designed to display just the desktop portions of the environment and to sort them into the appropriate categories. And so to get that done, we need to move to the full version of the dashboard. And you will notice that there's a, uh, a variety of of different uh, columns here. Some of them are grayed out, and we'll talk about that in a moment, how to get the desktop pools and users uh, pulled together. But you'll notice that some of them have a yellow gear. And what we're going to want to do is click on that yellow gear for desktops, and there's two different ways to add uh, desktops to this column. The first is the manual method. And to do this, uh, we would go ahead and look through our list of virtual machines, and if I go ahead and type view, you can see that I have a number of view desktops here. So I'm going to go ahead and select these view desktops and choose them to add. And that'll go ahead and manually add them. Now, for those of you that have non-persistent desktops, or you'd prefer to do it via name, you can use the membership rules option as an alternative to adding desktops. You can choose to select a new rule, and much like making a mail rule, you can choose whether the name starts with, contains, or an IP address range, put in the matching characters, and then go ahead and select them to automatically be added to the desktops. And this is is a great way if your desktops are basically created on demand for users. This will let you pick them up by name and have them auto-populate, if you will, into the, uh, into the dashboard. I'm going to go ahead and take my statically done desktops and I'm going to press the save button. As soon as I do that, the desktops are added to the column and you can see that the, metric, the metrics immediately start flowing into the column. And populating the rest of the dashboard is pretty much a straightforward exercise of clicking on these yellow gears and uh, going ahead and adding in the appropriate things. So I'm going to go ahead. I have a number of client machines uh, that I have accessible in uh, in my lab. So I'm going to go ahead and add them. If you had um, you know machines or, or address ranges set aside for client machines, you may be adding these. Now, what I will tell you about the clients column in particular is that in order for this to have value, you would need to have NetFlow information coming into the dashboard from the segments where these client machines are located. Otherwise, we would not be able to see the end-to-end -end network traffic from the clients to the desktops. Because this is a lab for me, the clients and the desktops are in the data center and I'm able to see the connectivity between them. What you would want to do to use this if you want to see the conversation all the way from the desktops to the clients is make sure that you've configured router data um, in the form of NetFlow to come to the dashboard and be reported. That's a bit outside the scope of this VDI video, uh, but you can certainly find out about that in the network dashboard videos and other resources that we have. Similarly,
When it comes to the host to client network paths and the host to server network paths, whether you'll be able to configure these depends on a couple of things. In terms of host to client network paths, this would measure the latency across the network from your data center to the actual client networks. And in order to monitor this, we would have to have some configuration information about those remote networks. This is done inside the general dashboard under the config menu under groups. And the exact configuration of that is a bit outside the scope of this video, but um, that is where you would go to configure to have information to, to use this. Now, I don't have that information, and so I'm going to actually just hide uh, that particular column. And you can see that it pops down here to the bottom. If you're using our flow summarizers, you will have host to server network paths. And I will go ahead and hit the edit button here. And I'm going to go ahead and grab the ones that are from my flow summarizers. When you install flow summarizers into an environment, they automatically build a full mesh between themselves in order to measure latency uh, within the data center. And while it's normally very, very low, uh, from time to time, if there's a problem with spanning tree or other things, this can be an early warning that something like that has occurred. If you're on a distributed switch and do not have the ability ability to do this, you can again, of course, simply hide this column. We would of course want hosts inside of our uh, dashboard. And so I'm going to go ahead and grab my hosts and we'll save those. And you can see that the process of doing this is relatively straightforward. I'm going to do the same thing with the data stores and I will grab the, uh, the NFS data store here that's at the heart of my lab. And in similar fashion, of course, the host to data store paths that connect the data stores to the hosts. And so I have several of these. Um, you will find that you can use the control key to go ahead and do multiple selection inside uh, this particular window. And so I'm going to grab the ones that have to do with that NFS data store. And uh, you can obviously make the right decisions for your environment. Now, the final two columns of this dashboard are the application servers and the IT servers. Uh, these are arbitrary categories for collecting other things that relate to the VDI infrastructure. If you are using application virtualization, perhaps ZenApp or ThinApp, you might wish to place those servers into the application servers category. Alternately, if there were particular applications that your users access, perhaps ERP applications or point of sale or other important applications or mail, and you wanted to particularly track the user population going to those application servers, those would all be good things to go ahead and select into this environment. And of course, as always, the way that we select things here is we basically look through the list of virtual machines that are in the data center. Now, if if as is common, you have a standalone vCenter that's just for the VDI environment, you may find that you need to add information from your server vCenter in order to have this list populate with the kind of servers that you would want or the kind of uh, VMs that you would want to have populate this, this window. So uh, if that's the case, you can always go back to the general dashboard into the setup and go ahead and add um, additional virtual machines into the environment. And uh, for my case uh, here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to pick these two user interface uh, VMs that, that have a, an application of importance to us. So I'm going to populate it with those two things. And you can either use this column or not, completely up to you. Similarly, with IT servers, the standard way that we use these at Zangati is to put things like connection brokers or provisioning servers, DNS, Active Directory, all of those kind of things into this IT servers category. And it can be a way to keep track of those kind of things in the environment. And you can either use this or not use this. And again, as always, if you choose not to use it, you can simply press the hide button. Now, at the point that you've worked your way across the entire dashboard and you'll have populated most of the columns, you will notice that, of course, for things like desktops and hosts and things like that, you're already getting data. And in fact, if there are performance issues in the environment, the dashboard will have already reflected those if there are things outside of best practice. But at this point, there are still a couple of things that are, that are left for us to do. The first is that at the moment, you can see the dashboard is not aware 
of desktop pools or desktop users. And in fact, we can't even click on a gear. Um, there's, there's simply nothing here for us to do. And that's because there's some additional configuration that we need to do to make these happen. The desktop pools and desktop users happen when our dashboard is able to communicate with the connection broker, whether that's a view manager server, a Zen desktop director server, a Leo stream server, and those connection brokers then tell us what the desktop pool structure is and which users are mapped to which desktops. So in order to set this up, we're going to need to move back to the general dashboard and do some configuration inside the setup. So go ahead and flip back over to the, uh, to the general dashboard. Once we're back in the general dashboard, we have two tasks that we need to accomplish in order to get desktop pools and user mapping functioning correctly. One of them is inside the setup and the other is actually on our connection brokers. In order to set up the connection brokers, you're going to want to go to the help menu and there's two ways to get the user's manual. One is to select user manual and you'll get it in HTML format or you can download it as a PDF. In either case, what you want to do is take the owner's manual and you're going to want to go towards the very, very end of it. And there is a section that is called connection server configuration on windows. And what you're going to want to do is open this up and it has a detailed set of instructions for commands that you need to run on your connection broker in order for us to be able to connect to it. Both VMware and Citrix have provided their APIs through a PowerShell connection. And so what these commands walk through is turning on PowerShell on your um, con connection broker and loading the appropriate PowerShell commandlets for your environment. And so there's a total of, of five or six commands here that need to be run as administrator inside PowerShell and command windows. And all of those things are listed out here. I'm not going to belabor this except to point out to you that in order for the steps we're about to take in setup to work, you're going to need to do this on each connection broker that you wish for us to talk to. It's not enough to just do one of them. Each one has to be done separately. So um, go ahead and get the owner's manual and RDP into your connection brokers and make that happen. When you get back from that, uh, what we're gonna wanna do is hit the setup and we're going to want to go to discovery and mapping and we're going to go to users and desktop pools. And here we're going to go ahead and choose the appropriate place for our environment. In my case, that's VMware view. It could just as easily be Citrix or the Leo stream connection broker. Um, they all configure about the same and certainly this will do to, to illustrate it. And what it'll do is it'll bring up a list of all of the configured connection servers. In my case, there are none as of yet. And so I'm going to need to go ahead and add in my connection broker. Now, as we do this, there's a number of things that need to be exactly correct. Now, I've gone ahead and filled mine out so that it can serve as a template for us to talk through. First of all, under the Windows domain, you're going to need to put the fully qualified domain name of the domain that your desktops and your connection brokers are in. And what needs to happen, if you choose discover automatically, we are going to do a DNS lookup on this domain name. And what we should get is the login server, the primary server for that domain, the domain controller um, that is responsible for the domain. And we're expecting to also be able to ask that server about DNS and to do DNS queries to that exact server. So if that's the case, you can use the discover automatically. If your domain controller is not your DNS server, you're going to need to manually enter the IP address of your domain controller so that we can uh, make heads or tails of the situation. The other thing you will need to do is put in um, the address to your view connection server and you can ignore the site when you um, type in the first, it will fill in the second. So there's no reason, there's no need to fill in the site. Um, then you're going to need to put in a username and a password that have ability to go in through remote PowerShell. And that is normally something with an administrator, something that maps to local administrator on the connection broker in question. Not so much as in Gotti requirement as one that is enforced by Windows itself. Windows expects you to have local administrator privileges in order to use a remote PowerShell interface. So when all of that is correct, you're definitely going to want to use the test button. 
The test button actually goes out and works through about 12 to 13 different dependencies that are actually required at the back of all of this for it to work correctly. And when it's all set up correctly, you will get the notification that all user settings are configured correctly. The errors that are reported if you misconfigure something are extremely uh, detailed and will point you to exactly what you need to do to resolve the situation. And so this test button is very much your friend. When you make the test button happy, you will go ahead and make your deployment happy. So once you've got that to be the case, you will go ahead and press the OK button there and you will also press OK to close. And then we'll press close again. After you've closed out, we're going to need to go ahead and save this configuration. So we will press the finish button and we will say yes. And at this point, the dashboard is going to go ahead and apply these settings. Once the setup has finished, we'll go ahead and close the window. And what we want to do is to find out if we've begun to receive user information uh, from the connection broker. And the way that we do that is we go to the discovery tab and down here at the bottom, there is a place that says users. And what you're going to want to do is change it from unmapped to mapped. And when you do that, you may notice that there are users. You may notice there are not. It takes a couple of minutes for this to happen. So if you don't see something immediately, don't despair, but continue to check back and see when you've got users and desktop pools listed here. Um, you will not be able to configure anything in the VDI dashboard until they show up here. So this is a great use of the general dashboard to test this out. Once you notice that you have some users, and some desktop pools, you'll know that you're ready to go ahead and finish the configuration inside the VDI dashboard. Now, one important thing to note is that you may find that you have desktop pools almost immediately, and you may find yourself with a blank users screen. And one of the reasons for that is if there are no VDI users logged in in your environment, perhaps like in a lab or something like that, where people sometimes tend to deploy um, a trial appliance, then you will not have any mapped users because there's simply no one logged in. The users are actually mapped at the time they log in and then we cache them for future use as they come and go. So until somebody actually logs in, they won't be mapped. And so this list will obviously build over time as your users log in and are using the system. And of course, we check periodically for new users um, as well. But once you have um, your users, you can go ahead and uh, come back to your dashboard and you will notice that you now have yellow gears here where we can go ahead and add uh, our desktop pools. And so again, you can go ahead and select these things either manually or by name uh, if you prefer to use the, uh, the membership rules. And you can press save. And of course, immediately the information starts to populate the column. And the same thing with the users. Um, I have a couple of users logged in in my environment. And so I'll go ahead and add their information uh, into my dashboard the same way as we've seen the others. Now, at the point that you've made it through all of that and you have your pools, your users, your desktops, um, whether or not you have clients and you've got hosts and data stores and all of these various things in there, you are very close to a fully configured VDI dashboard. Probably the one other thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to come uh, under the options menu and enter a default WMI login. The default WMI logins, these are what enable us to get the process level information out of the desktops. And so what you're going to want to do here is go ahead and press add. You're going to want to enable this, maybe set it as the default. Um, if it is the default and then go ahead, give it a name, put in the domain name that you're working with, and then an, an account that has administrator privileges for that domain. Um, the reason for that is that again, WMI, just like remote PowerShell, expects to have a user that maps to local administrator privileges on the desktop in question. And so obviously if you have multiple domains or have split things up, you can go ahead and do defaults or you can do logins per domain in order to make this active. And what that will do is once you're um, you've got your system set up and you're looking at um, your particular desktop. Should you want to go into the, the Windows system viewer, if you don't put this information in, you will get an error like the following. The WMI setting is not configured. Please configure your WMI setting. And the way that you'll do that is you'll go up under options and uh, choose a um, some WMI logins to define.
Well, at that point, you have successfully configured your VDI appliance. It is ready for action and may already be displaying useful information to you. It will continue to build profiles for the first seven days, uh, over which time it's going to be trying to summarize the environment and learn normal behavior patterns. And uh, some of the learned profiles will begin to take effect as that process completes. So enjoy your new VDI dashboard. And obviously, if there's anything we can do to help you out with that, please contact us through our website. If you don't yet have a copy of the dashboard, but would like one, please just download it from our website at www.zangati.com.